Hi there, it's Sarah here from VJC Health and you're about to watch part one of our online event, All About Gout. It's going to be presented by Dr. Adam Wondrell. He's a rheumatologist based in Sydney, Australia. And he's gonna be talking specifically about all the different things that you can do to try and manage and prevent gout attacks, covering things involving medication, but also talking about things that aren't medication related that can help assist you in managing your gout. So um, enjoy part one of the presentation and hope to see you on the screen soon. Hello, welcome to tonight's event. Nice to see you all. Everyone get comfy <laughs> and just get yourself settled for tonight's event, but nice to see you all. And uh, we're looking forward to tonight's session. It's all about gout. So we've got two speakers that'll be sort of handling tonight's uh, topic. So we've got Dr. Adam. So if you haven't met Adam before, he's got a lot of interesting stuff going on. So he's actually probably the best tennis player at BJC Health. Uh, there's a few good tennis players, but Adam I've seen in action, he's really good. Um, and he's got a really strong interest in gout, which is tonight's topic. And he's also um, done a bit of work in the Cook Islands, which has been known to have a lot of gout. So you can ask him about that. And he's also asked us, I guess, to let you know that his very cute golden retriever has just decided to come in from outside and sit right next to him. So if you hear some scratching, it might be because, uh, you know, Adam's dog's there, but uh, he'll be leading the, uh, tonight's presentation. He's a rheumatologist. And we've also got Monica, who's a dietitian, will also be chiming in as well. So um, welcome once again. I'll hand over to you, Adam. Hi, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm just going to share my screen to start with. Okay. So yeah, I apologies in advance if my dog does decide to muck up. She just decided now it was a wonderful time to go and play in the rain and the mud and then come and sit by me and share her dirt and mud. So at least we've got the camera from this level. <laughs> so first of all, I'm just gonna start by talking about what is gout and, and hopefully this is stuff people know, but I like to go through this because I find every time I see people with gout, um, I hear a lot of myths and, and there's just so much misinformation about gout in the community. That's probably things you come across yourself when you're trying to research about gout, when you talk to um, health professionals about gout, when um, you read things, talk to people. So I think that I'm hoping tonight we can just kind of, you know, dispel some of those myths, all get on the same page. And if there's any questions, if you're hearing anything that you know, contradicts what you've heard before or you're not quite sure about, please type in the chat box and we'll, we'll clarify as we go. So gout is essentially a buildup of uric acid in the body. And if it builds up enough, what it does is it starts to deposit in joints, even tendons around the body, and then intermittently can trigger really acute, painful inflammation. And the characteristic thing with gout is the joint gets very painful. You know, I've looked after people in hospital before, which are footballers, very tough, are in tears and can't walk because it's so painful. The joint often gets red, often hot, but not always, and, and very, very swollen. And the classic thing with gout is even if you do nothing, it just disappears on its own. So that can last anywhere from days to, to a couple of weeks. But the, the critical thing is it does disappear. And then you're left feeling normal, thinking, what on earth just happened? And for some people, it might not happen again. For others, it might happen next week or next month, next year. Everybody's a bit different. But the important thing is you get this acute inflammation and then you're normal in between flare-ups. The classic spot like this um, photo here is in the big toe joint, but it can happen in just about any joint around the body. It can be really severe, like this um, man you can see here. So it's uh, all through the wrist and the hand and the whole thing can get swollen. It can look like it's more in the skin itself and not just in the joint. And I just want to warn everyone, I do have a gross photo coming up. So if you are easily squeamish with, with things, anytime I even mention things like this to my brother, who's a, a landscaper, he just about faints. So if anyone's like that, please just cover your eyes just for a second. Um, but, but this is someone else who had a really severe flare-up of gout. So this is, uh, sometimes you can get the uric acid not just in the inside the joint, but it builds up into what we call a tophus, which is a visible build up lump of gout um, around the joint. And then that can get inflamed as well. And if you get enough pressure, it can kind of burst and ooze out uh, some white chalky discharge, which you can see there. And that is just essentially the uric acid uh, material. So some people think, well, will I do any harm if I don't treat my gout? And I would say, yes, you certainly would. 
So if we don't treat it, the uric acid just keeps building and building and building. And this is what I'm talking about here with uh, the, the gouty toe fice. You can see on the top right corner, somebody's uh, elbow tophus in the fingers. You can see all the gouty build up here. Um, and also you can get deformity. So we can see in the top left corner, this person has had enough damage from the gout that the fingers started to go off at funny angles. So it's not a benign thing. If you have this uh, untreated for long enough, you can get damage to the joints. So this is the x-ray and you can see here um, where the arrows are conveniently pointing for us, we can see the erosion. So these are holes in the bone from the inflammation from the recurrent gout attacks. So really we want to treat it, one, because we don't want people to have pain, but also we want to prevent these uh, erosions because erosions you can't undo. And if you get enough of them, that's when you start to get deformity in the joints. So I'm rehashing myself here. I'm a wuss with pain. I don't want any pain in my life at all, really. And, and you know, if I was getting gout, I'd certainly want to treat it. Treated. Uh, we definitely want to prevent deformity because it is entirely preventable and there's no excuse to get it in this day and age at all. Gout impairs function, both from the flare-ups. When you've got a flare, you really can't do much. Uh, but also if you get deformity, that's going to impact on your function as well. So we, we want to prevent that. Gout's been shown, or people that don't have adequately controlled gout, they have reduced work participation because, again, the flare-ups mean they're in too much pain to go to work. So it has financial implications potentially for people. And importantly, and I think this is something we're going to cover a bit more later tonight, is that gout has an association with other diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, and obesity. And, you know, together, a lot of this is what we call the metabolic syndrome. So, you know, another reason we want to treat gout is because none of us want to have any of these other associated conditions. So why does uric acid build up in the first place? And I think this is, you know, probably the sign of one of the biggest myths going around. Now, the main, you know, there are lots of contributing factors like obesity oops, can um, increase the, the uric acid levels in the body. And that's been well shown that if you lose weight, your uric acid levels do come down a little bit. Alcohol does contribute to uric acid levels. And in terms of developing gout, beer is the main thing we worry about, but spirits can also increase the risk of developing gout. Once you have gout, wine as well can also increase the risk of flares. Different foods, and again, this is what uh, Monica will be talking about later on, but shellfish, fish, meat, poultry, sugary drinks, potatoes, tomatoes, these are foods and drinks that can contribute to higher uric acid levels. But the real main point I want to make tonight, and this is what I want everyone to remember, is the main risk of developing gout is genetic. So I think a lot of people have shame about the fact they have gout. You know, they think, oh, I'm a glutton or I'm an alcoholic. I've had so many patients say that to me. Or, you know, they have family members or friends that think they're an alcoholic and they're hiding it because they have gout. And it's just garbage. It's just not the truth. I see a lot of people who eliminate all these things from their diet. They don't eat any of this stuff. They don't drink any of this stuff. They've still got high uric acid and they still have gout because at the end of the day, the main risk for developing gout is genetic. And that's been well proven. So that's myth number one. I really want to drum in tonight. And so ultimately, and again, this is what we'll come back to talk more about later. Ultimately, because the main risk for developing gout in the first place is genetic, ultimately, you still need medication to lower the uric acid level. Even if you eliminate, you know, all these dietary things, um, alcohol, lose weight, for most people, that's not enough and you do need medication. But again, we will go through that in more detail. So that's for developing gout. What triggers a flare-up in the first place? So dietary things can, can flare it up. And everyone's dietary triggers I find are a bit different. You know, for some people it is shellfish, for some people it's meat, for some people it is alcohol. Um, again, everyone is a, is a bit different. But certain diet things can potentially trigger flares. If you get dehydrated, you get an acute shift in the uric acid level in the body. And that's a really common cause for a flare up of gout. So maintaining hydration is a really important thing. Certain medications, in particular, um, particular or certain fluid uh, tablets, or what we call diuretics, can trigger gout. Um, trauma to joint can trigger a flare-up. Starvation, uh, again, that comes down to acute shifts in the uric acid level, can lead to um, gout flares. Alcohol, as we talked about, but it can also just be random. It can happen for no reason at all. Before I go on, do we have any questions at all, Sarah? 
Not yet. You must be captivating everyone. But just Stunned remind everyone. everyone, yeah, that's right. You must have <laughs> already. So go okay. for it. You go. Just a reminder, please interrupt and ask a question if you want. Happy to pause at any point. Um, so how do we treat gout? Now, there's two aspects to treating gout, and this is what I always like to um, explain to my patients. First of all, there's the aspect of treating the acute flare-ups of gout, and then there's the aspect of preventing flare-ups in the first place. And they're, they're two completely separate aspects to treating gout. So if you have an acute flare-up, so if you have that acutely painful, swollen, red joint, we know, you know it's confirmed gout, uh, there's different options to treat that. So anti-inflammatories, things like ibuprofen, which is Nurofen, um, Voltaren, Indesid, Mobic, Meloxicam, Celebrex, these things are anti-inflammatories. They can be used to treat acute flare-ups. We do have to be careful using anti-inflammatories because like every drug, there are potential side effects. And anti-inflammatories we worry about because they can irritate the stomach lining and worst case scenario, cause an ulcer in the stomach. Plus they can impact on kidney function. Now, as we get older, all our kidney function does reduce a bit with age. Normally, that's part of the aging process. And if you take a lot of anti-inflammatories, that can make that worse. So we need to uh, be careful with the kidneys in particular and people. I get concerned for people over the age of 65 in particular using anti-inflammatories for that reason. Uh, another option is colchicine. So the brand names for that are Colgout or Lengout. That's pretty mild. And, and you know, if you have, like, uh, say, the big toe, and you hit it really early with colchicine, it can often terminate a flare-up. But if you're getting bigger joints like knees or wrists, or you're getting more than one joint involved, from my experience, colchicine can be pretty useless really and not, not be enough to control the flare-up. Another option is prednisolone. So some people call that cortisone or prednisone. It's all the same thing. It's basically a steroid medication that's stronger at reducing inflammation. And that can come in tablet forms or rheumatologists or, or some other doctors too can inject the joint uh, that's involved. And that's definitely the most potent way to treat an acute flare-up. Um, but they're drugs you only want for short courses, not, not long-term. But then ultimately, like I said, what we really want to do is prevent the flare-ups happening in the first place because who wants to have a flare-up? And ultimately that is done by lowering the uric acid. And the number one to do that is with a drug called allopurinol or the brand names you might've heard of Progout or Xylopro. And that's our go-to drug in gout. It's very effective to lower uh, the uric acid level. I will say as well, this is another medication where we see a lot of myths um, when it comes to, to its use. So when we use allopurinol, we're not aiming for a particular dose. That doesn't exist. We're basically aiming to get the uric acid level down below a specific target. And again, genetically, everybody breaks down allopurinol differently. So some people need a tiny dose of allopurinol. Some people need a massive dose of allopurinol. We can't predict that. You basically just have to start at small doses, wait a few weeks for it to fully kick in and work, check the uric acid level and see if it's come down enough. And if it hasn't, you increase the allopurinol dose, wait another month or so, repeat the blood test again, and you keep doing that until you get the uric acid level down into the target range. Um, and again, everybody's going to be different. So you can't really compare with friends and family regarding doses uh, because, again, genetically, we're all a bit different and we will all need different doses. It's not about the dose. It's about getting the uric acid level down low enough. Now, some people can't tolerate allopurinol. Some people get allergic reactions to it, get a rash. Um, very rarely it can upset the liver or the blood count, so that's very uncommon. Um, so then another option is a drug called Febuxostat. That works by the same way as allopurinol. The principles are exactly the same in how we treat that or use that. Another option, it's pretty rare that you can't tolerate either of those two drugs. Uh, and so another option is a drug called Probenicid or Procid is the, the brand name. That works via a different mechanism. It's not quite as effective, um, but you might see that around. So then I suppose this is the whole purpose of the talk tonight and why people are here. And, and, and what are the non-medication options for, for treating gout? And I'm sorry to be a Debbie Downer, but unfortunately, they're often not enough on their own. And, and really, I could, I was talking to one of my patients this morning, and I, I think I saw him come up on, on the list there, but, and he asked me about tonight's talk. And he said, oh, I thought essentially it just came down to medication to control it. And I said, yes, that sums up tonight's talk, really. <laughs> so, I mean, diet and these non-medication options can make small differences. 
But at the end of the day, for most people, um, medication is the only way to lower the uric acid level enough to prevent ever having gout again in the future. Now, weight loss can make a difference. And so for people that are morbidly obese, um, you know, they are at higher risk of having higher uric acid levels and having more flare-ups. And it's been shown that if they lose weight, if people lose weight, the uric acid level can lower and it reduces the risk of flare-ups. But it's pretty rare to lower the uric acid level enough to completely prevent flare-ups 100%. But I think, as we said before, gout can be associated with other conditions like heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol, like we talked about. And obviously, if you're overweight, that also is associated with um, risk for those conditions. So losing weight has the added benefit of reducing your risk with all these conditions. Diet, and again, we, Monica's got more slides to talk about this. Diet can trigger flares. Um, and again, like I said before, people can have uh, vary with that, have foods that you know, they themselves find trigger flare-ups. But really from all the studies that have been done, from dietary, if you, if you, you know, follow a, um, the diet that Monica will talk about in a tick, it, there is a small contribution to reducing the uric acid level but it's not enough to completely control it. People still need medication in the vast, vast, vast majority of um, situations. So, I mean, I've seen quite a lot of patients that come in and they're really despondent because they're just on the most awfully deplete diets that aren't good for them. Uh, and they're miserable because they're not having any of the foods they enjoy. They're not drinking any alcohol at all. And they don't understand why they're still getting gout. And again, that comes back to the fact that the reason people get gout is because the uric acid builds up for genetic reasons. And, you know, we need medication ultimately to control that. So I'll hand over to Monica now to, to talk a little bit more about, about diet. Oh, except can I ask questions first? Please, <laughs> You've yes. got a couple now, Adam. So, Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one was, could you just clarify the target range that you're actually trying to get down to? Okay. With your so that depends whether or not people have TOFI. So again, the TOFI are those visible lumps of gout that we see around the joints that I showed photos of earlier. If people have TOFI, it means there's more burden from the uric acid in the body and we need to get the target down lower. So if there are TOFI, we need the uric acid level to be less than 0.3. If people do not have TOFI, so we can't visibly see any lumps, we need it less than 0.36. And so I think an important point to make is when you look at the, the blood test results and the laboratory puts a reference range, it does differ between different labs, but it often says normal is up to 0.45 or 0.46. It differs between, between the labs. So sometimes people come in and they say, well, I've got a normal uric acid um, and it's 0.4, but it's actually not in the target you need to get out. So it's less than 0.36 if there's no TOFI, less than 0.3 if, um, if you do have TOFI. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this next one, someone's mentioned that they tried allopurinol after a break and it made their gout worse. And then big thank you to Josephine. So Josephine's mentioned, I'll just share with you what Josephine wrote and then see if you've got anything to add. And Josephine's written, that's because starting slash restarting allopurinol can trigger an acute attack because it triggers a rapid reduction in the uric acid. Wow, um, awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'm like, oh, Joseph, is that Very correct? Impressive. Yeah, it is, it is. Awesome. Get up here and... and yeah, and she can the next one. <laughs> awesome. So and that's completely correct. So when you start allopurinol, whenever you start it, whenever you stop it, whenever you change the dose, you get an acute shift in the uric acid level and it can trigger a flare-up. So for that reason, that's one of the reasons we should be starting at a small dose of allopurinol and building the dose up slowly. Um, and normally, when I start people on allopurinol, I also use colchicine at the same time to prevent any of those flare-ups. And so often I get people referred to me who, who are struggling to start allopurinol because they're getting too many flare-ups and it's because they're starting on too high a dose and they're not getting um, something like colchicine to prevent the flare-ups whilst we're making those adjustments. Yeah, excellent. Very rarely someone, can't, like I've got a couple of patients that really struggle and we're on the most tiny doses and we have to use some prednisolone and steroids too. It's never not a reason to not be starting allopurinol. It just means we have to do a better job of reducing the inflammation while we start the allopurinol. And it will only get better as we go. Mm, good one. Um, 
Another one, just a combination question that speaks to what you've just mentioned a little bit. But what would you say if someone had a blood test and the uric acid is high, um, do they still need treatment if there's no TOFI and they're not getting any attacks? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And the answer is no. So lots of people in the community have high uric acid levels in the blood and they don't necessarily have gout. If you don't have gout, so if you're not having any episodes of the acute joint pain and swelling, then no, there is no reason to be treating the uric acid in isolation. And they've done quite a lot of studies in that. There's no benefit to it, really. So mm -hmm. no point to take a medication for no reason. Excellent. That's good to know. Um, and the same person's asking, you mentioned just one combination, but you know how on your slide you talked about there's medications for those acute flare-ups versus the longer term? Um, what combinations of medications can be used together? Um, can you combine all of them or are there particular pairings that you have um, found to be more successful? So for an acute um, flare-up, if you're going to use anti-inflammatories, I wouldn't com uh, combine them with anything else like colchicine or is alone. Culture and prednisolone can be used together, but you only really need the prednisolone. You don't really need the culture scene as well, so there's no need to combine in that setting. Um, in terms of the uh, long, you know, preventing flare-ups, so you would never com um, combine allopurinol and febuxostat because they work via the same mechanism. There's no need to compare them. You have one or the other. Sometimes you will com um, combine either allopurinol uh, or for boxes that with probenicid because they work via different mechanisms and very rarely you need kind of an extra boost, but that's extremely uncommon that you need to do that. If people are on allopurinol long-term, but we're still trying to build up the dose and they have a flare-up, it's perfectly safe to have either an anti-inflammatory or colchicine or prednisolone in addition to the allopurinol, but that's just a short-term thing. Okay, excellent. Um, and I'll... We'll get to this question, I guess, in Monica's, but Monica, just so you know, someone has already asked, and it, it always comes up when we talk about GABA, do I have to completely eliminate alcohol? And maybe that's a nice segue onto you cracking on with your stuff. And, and keep asking questions, everyone. Adam will be here, of course, for the rest of the presentation. But, yeah, go for it, Mon. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Adam. That was amazing. Um, the good news is I'll answer that straight away. No, you don't have to completely give up alcohol, and that's partly because of what Adam has said in that with the diet side. So these are 10 strategies to consider. Uh, it's not that you have to do all of these things. And I think if you have a little bit of experience with gout, most of my clients who I've seen for gout will work out what's good for them and what's not good for them as they go along and I guess experience it in the hard way because then they, they get the attacks and then they know what they can and can't do. Um, Obviously, the medication is the most important. Like I even know that with my father-in-law, one of the only times he might get an attack occasionally is at Christmas when he eats loads and loads of prawns and oysters and shellfish and might have a beer. And if, if he's not um, consistent with his medication, then he'll get these breakthrough flares. So the medication is important. And then we need to consider some of these things so that you keep your foods in moderation. The important thing is, as Adam mentioned, a lot of these strategies, not the first one, but a lot of these strategies will also help you with lowering cholesterol, managing weight, um, managing your insulin levels and your blood sugar control. And because those things are linked to gout, you're not going to lose by doing a lot of these strategies. And for those of you that hear me speak a lot, a lot of the things that I will mention in my list tonight uh, a food strategies we're trying to encourage you to do day to day anyway. So let's look at number one. Um, number one, uh, the advice across the board from a dietitian's perspective would be to have a look at reducing your intake of what we call purine rich foods, because purines break down into uric acid. So for most people, they'll say to me, no problems, I'm happy not to eat liver and kidneys and brain, I can give those things up. Um, uh, most people are happy to stick to moderate portions of meat and chicken and uh, salmon or tuna or whitefish, trying not to eat too much herring and mackerel, sardines, anchovies, prawns, all the really good shellfish type of things. Um, being careful with yeast and meat extracts, so Vegemite, Promite, 
um, lots of stocks that have yeast extracts in them. Not so much, we're not so much concerned about the yeast in bread, but it's just overdoing some of um, these types of foods. Now, in that moderate level, there was a time when I first graduated as a dietitian that I had other dietitians say to me that they try and get their clients not to eat much meat, chicken, fish, and even some of these vegetables. And as Adam said, most people are miserable if they do that. I mean, I've got, I bought a beautiful fresh cauliflower today and some beautiful asparagus and one of the biggest mushrooms I've seen. Um, these foods are anti-inflammatory. They're anti-cancer. They're really good for your body in so many ways. And research has shown that purine rich vegetables and uh, proteins like legumes there's a bit of chickpeas here, um, do not flare up gout like maybe they once thought it did. So I don't want you to avoid those types of purine-rich foods or even oats, which are going to be part of the lower GI carbohydrates that are really good for cholesterol lowering because of the beta-glucan um, and they've got soluble fibre. So if you're going to look at your purine rich foods, go for those top ones, the really high ones. And what is important is that you are mindful of your portion of meat, which we're mindful for for so many other reasons anyway. So dietary research will tell you to try and not eat more than 100 grams of cooked meat in any one sitting. This is what that looks like. So I normally say to you it's about the palm of your hand. So if I put that over there, I'm pretty much bang on. I actually weighed this before I brought it in. I cooked it and then I weighed it before um, I came in for the talk. This is 96 grams of cooked meat. Now, if you put lots of vegetables with that and a little bit of a low GI carbohydrate, you have a perfectly filling meal without overdoing the meat portion. Okay, so that's strategy number one. So that was part one of our online event all about gout. I uh, hope you found it informative. And if you'd like to check out the full presentation, then please consider joining BJC Connect. It's our online platform where we host a range of live events and where you can access the recordings, not just only of the rest of this event, but lots of other events that we've run in the past as well that you might find useful. So thanks so much for watching. Hope to see you on the screen again soon.